In this tutorial, in addition to looking at how we scale 3D models, we're also going to analyze what scaling really means by combining scaling transformations with the rotations that we covered in the previous tutorial. We'll start by using GLM transformation matrices to scale individual vertices, and then we'll combine scaling with rotations and look at why reversing the order of multiplication is considered to be a mistake, unlike for rotations where it just changes from a local to a global rotation. So scaling is nothing more than just increasing or decreasing the x, y or z values by some multiple. For example, this vertex has x equals 2, y equals 4 and z equals 3. And if we multiply each of those positional values by some scaling value, so let's use 5, we get the scaled result 10, 20 and 15. To scale a model by using GLM, we just need to pass our matrix to the GLM scale function along with our scaling values. So for example, to scale the x axis by a factor of 5, but leave the y and z axes as unscaled, we pass in 5 for the x value and 1 for the y and z values. All we need to do then is pass the matrix to the vertex shader as a uniform, and then inside the vertex shader, we just place the matrix immediately to the left of the vertex being processed. Dudes, just to let you know that once you've understood everything that I show you about these 3x3 rotation matrices and scaling matrices and what it really means when we multiply them together, which I'm going to show you in considerable detail throughout this video, you will have really understood everything that you're going to need to know about how they work. I'm just about to show you what it looks like when we scale the model along the x-axis by a factor of 5, so I'm going to clear off and I'm going to let me carry on. I'll see you in a bit. Cheers. Let's also change the camera position to give us a better view. But we know that all we're doing is simply multiplying APOS by some scaling value, so inside the vertex shader, instead of multiplying the vertex APOS position by the scaling matrix, we can simply multiply its x, y or z value directly by the scaling value and we'll get exactly the same result. So let's simplify the code. We need to declare a new VEC3, which we'll call new POS, and assign APOS to it, and then multiply its x value by the scaling value and then send that result directly to the fragment shader. Likewise, we also need to remove the model matrix from the GL position line, but notice how we're still using the transpose of the inverse of the model matrix to transform the normal vectors, which is because if we simply multiplied the normal vectors x value by the x scaling value, like we have done for the vertex position, the normal becomes all messed up. Although properly understanding what the transpose of the inverse looks like geometrically is for another tutorial, but for now, as you can see here, we can still see why it's straightforward for rotations, but more complicated when scaling is involved. When extending a line from coordinates 0, 0, 0 at the centre of the scene, just a single position in 3D space produces the normal vector. And so when we rotate those normals exactly the same as when we rotate the model itself, the normals are correct. However, just by scaling the model, we can see how the normals change direction, and so I'm cheating a little bit here by using the transpose of the inverse, as usual, to solve the problem. Anyway, if we now save the file and run the program, we should get the same result as when using matrices. And then just for fun, let's increase the scaling value to a really high number. And now we can see that the model has been stretched ridiculously wide. Now keep in mind that the left column in the matrix represents the x-axis, the middle column represents the y-axis, and the right column represents the z-axis, and that each axis has an x, y, and z component. The x components are in the first row, the y components are in the second row, and the z components are in the third row. And because the purpose of a scaling matrix all by itself doesn't involve rotations, all the values it contains are zero, apart from the x component of the x-axis, the y component of the y-axis, and the z component of the z-axis. However, in the previous tutorial, which was about rotations, when we rotated around the z-axis, we saw how the x-axis gained a y component, which is this sign 30 shown in red, and the y-axis gained an x component, which is this negative sign 30 shown in green. Now keep in mind that we're multiplying the first row of the rotation matrix, which produces the 7.83, which comes from the initial x value of 9, and the minus 6, which comes into existence, but to get the 4.5 which comes into existence, we need to multiply the second row, as you can see here. Now the length of the three axes is arbitrary because they're shown just for illustration purposes, but visually the angle of each axis does represent the values in the corresponding column of the matrix. 
Therefore, we know that a rotation matrix represents the angle of rotation of all three axes. And we know that to scale a point in 3D space, we just need to slide its X value along its own rotated axis, its Y value along its rotated axis, and its Z value along its rotated axis. Therefore, just like we multiply the X, Y, and Z components of direction vectors by some multiple to travel through 3D space in the given direction, we need to do the same thing for any of the three axes inside the rotation matrix that we want to scale. For example, if we want to scale along only the X axis, we need to multiply the X axis components by the scaling X value. So let's have a closer look by changing the view so that we're looking directly along the Z axis into screen. This is before the rotation and this is after rotating 30 degrees. These are the two X components. So this one subtracted from this one is its new X value. Let's watch that once more. So the sum of the two red vectors continuously represents the X value of the yellow vertex. Likewise, the sum of the two green vectors continuously represents the Y value of the yellow vertex. Now, obviously there's nothing special about that yellow vertex. And so exactly the same logic applies to all eight vertices of the purple box that we've already been scaling. And so here's the really awesome part. Now that the axes have been rotated, we could scale both of the X components, but that would be wrong. Instead, we need to scale along both components of the X axis. So just one of the X components, which is this one, and the X axis Y component that's just come into existence, which is this one. To apply scaling to a rotation matrix by using GLM, we just multiply the rotation matrix by the scaling matrix, making sure that we place the rotation matrix to the left of the scaling matrix. Just here, I've changed the matrix name from model map to scale map. I've also declared a rotation matrix just here, which we rotate on this line, and then I've added a combined matrix just here, which we assign the result of multiplying both matrices together. The code in the vertex shader hasn't changed, so if we compile this and then run it, we should see the model stretched out along the x-axis as before, but now also rotating around the z-axis. But if we reverse the order of multiplication and then recompile the program and run it again, we can see the scaling has become all messed up. It looks like the model is squashed along the z-axis and also stretched out along the y-axis. The reason that happens is because the scaling value for the given axis is being applied to values in other axes. As an example, let's just look at the result of the multiplication for the first row. Wherever we see the number 5, which is our scaling value, it must be multiplied by a component in the same axis, which we know makes sense because we've just seen how scaling an individual axis is exactly the same thing as scaling a direction vector in order to travel in that direction. So with the scaling matrix placed to the right, we get the correct results. Our scaling value of 5 for the x-axis is being multiplied by the x component of the x-axis, and it's also correct for the y-axis and the z-axis. But if we place the scaling matrix to the left, we get the wrong results. Our scaling value of 5 for the x-axis is being multiplied by the x component of the y-axis, and it's also wrong here. And so in practice, all we need to do is remember to place the rotation matrix to the left of the scaling matrix. So once again, now that we understand what GLM is doing, we can transform the vertex positions by combining scaling with rotations directly inside the vertex shader. We need to pass the counter variable to the vertex shader and use it to produce a continuous rotation, just like we did in the previous tutorial. These are the two lines of code that we used in the previous tutorial to rotate around the z-axis, which are literally just the contents of the rotation matrix, but without any zeros and simply not being shown inside square brackets. We can see that these two terms are the x-axis because they're being multiplied by the APOS x values. Likewise, we can see that these two terms are the y-axis because they're being multiplied by the APOS y values. Therefore, to scale the rotated x-axis, we simply multiply its x component by 5 and its y component by 5. And when we compare doing it this way to when using matrices, we can see the results are identical. Or we can scale the y-axis in exactly the same way which again, when compared to using matrices, we can see the results are identical. And of course, we can scale it evenly along both axes. We can also apply scaling when rotating around the x-axis in exactly the same way, just as we could do for the y-axis if we wanted to. And we can also get creative by using the rotational value of the uniform counter variable 
to gradually scale the model as it rotates. Don't forget to subscribe and see you next time. Cheers.